Perfect. Why don't we go ahead and, and kick this off then? So I'm Jacob. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the co-founder of Comcore and Community Chat. And today we've got an incredible panel with four leaders um, and, and builders in the in the community tool space. And we're going to be talking about what the next 10 years are going to be be looking like from a virtual tools perspective as the world is just taken by storm by the, by the explosion of, of new tools and platforms and ways in which people can interact meaningfully digitally. So uh, I'm going to do a quick quick round of introductions, then I'm going to hand it over to, to Jason Grad to help facilitate the panel. So we have uh, Rob Gelb. He's the founder and CEO of, of Hey Summit. It's a platform for, for hosting virtual summits and, and events. Uh, John Saddington, he's the founder and CEO of, of Yen.io. It's a platform for helping founders, as he calls them, Yenizens, uh, to jumpstart digital community. <laughs> and uh, we also have John Peterson, who's the founder and CEO of The Nudge, one of the most popular text message-based communities for, for millennials. And, and full disclosure, I'm actually a nudger myself, and it's uh, one of the few things that I really look forward to every single week in my iMessage inbox. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jason Grad, who's the CEO and, and co-founder of, of Massive. So Jason, you want to kick us off? Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's good to be here today and um, talk about one of my favorite things, which is building communities. Um, I'm just going to walk us through a conversation here and talk about um, kind of what's new in the world of uh, community tools and what what brought you guys here to build these tools for everyone. Uh, and with that, you know, I'd love to kick it off by asking you guys, um, there was already kind of uh, some catalyzation around community building way before the pandemic hit obviously now there's an even greater need for online tools but you know why do you think the timing finally came about that people are really paying attention to building communities even pre-pandemic and then obviously you know how is that being accelerated now what do you see i can have a go uh i uh i think uh, in, in general, it, 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 it's not new, this idea that you want to combine forces or join forces with other people to learn something new or to connect on an interest level rather than just with your family or just with your friends. Uh, you know, that, that, that's not new, um, nor, has, uh, nor is it new to, to try and connect with those people online. Um, but oftentimes the, the depth of that link has, has been, um, you know, artificially kept pretty shallow. Uh, you know, it's always been easier to connect with like-minded people on platforms that already have that social validation, that social uh, network validation. Um, and with the recent kind of decoupling and 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 beginning of like a, a decentralization of uh, of of the internet, it's made uh, the barrier to entry and the the willingness for people to get onto something new uh, and go to a, a particular destination because that speaks to them for that persona, that version of themselves, that's, that's just become a lot easier. Uh, and, um, and, and so I, I, I definitely see that that's like a, a key reason uh, why um, there are just so many awesome platforms out there. And there's an, there's a, a, a willingness for people to coexist on different platforms, depending on what it is that they're wanting to do, achieve, learn, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So, so kind of the uh, the one size fits all kind of Facebook no longer fits anyone um, for really what they need online. Um, John Peterson Saddington, do you guys want to chime in there? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think Robert has been very very kind. I mean, I think this pandemic has just forced everyone to go online. I mean, whether we like it or not, sometimes <clears throat> unless you want to go to jail like in some places, which is actually happening crazy. But I think what Robert said is exactly right. There's there's a massive decoupling happening. And it's simply because of a show of, of, of absolute quantitative force. Like, you know, chocolate and vanilla ice cream is good when you have, you know, a community that just likes chocolate and vanilla ice cream. But the moment you add the, the entire universe, suddenly it's like, oh my God, chocolate and vanilla is just, that's just not enough. So all of these great new community platforms are coming up online because it's showcasing that diversity of thought, the diversity of need. Um, and there's so many be bespoke customizations that I think are going to come up online this, this year. It's going to be so fucking exciting. So I think, yeah, I agree hundred percent with Robert said, I think he was a little bit kind, like we are in this, like, and, and the folks here at this conference, we are the flag bearers. 
like the fact that that the four of us are chatting here, the fact that the folks here are watching, like it's because this small group of folks, we really, really, really care about the future of the internet, about the future of community and how it's gonna empower our businesses and our lives and, and our livelihood. So man, I I couldn't be more stoked. I just wanna shut up and listen to the other two, two, three guys here talk, but I'm on this panel because I honestly just wanna hear what these brilliant people have to say. So I'm excited to be here, thanks. Um, I I totally agree with everything John and Rob said. I guess the one thing I'd add is I'm seeing an increased comfort in participating in communities. You know, there's kind of a spectrum in terms of how much of a community person are you? You know, like obviously you have these people who, you know, are posting on Facebook saying, hey, you know, who wants to go to this thing tonight? You know, to hundreds of people. You know, these are like the part Part time. And I think what the pandemic and what's going on in the country this week has sort of done is it's, I don't know if it's the right way of saying it, but it's almost like it feels more okay. like any stigma that there might have ever been with being really, really uh, sharing your thoughts and sharing resources with people just gone now. You know, and so I've seen this with our community, which is like, you know, we text people things to do and we text them resources for being a part of this lifestyle community that we have. But when the pandemic started, the percentage of people who then took those resources and shared them on social media went up like 10,000%. It was crazy, you know, because there's just this sense that like, uh, we're helping each other now, you know, it's okay to say, hey, I found this thing, you guys might like it, even though I don't consider myself an influencer, so to speak. And so I just think the vibe got really like, maybe we would have gotten here in five or 10 years, but we just kind of got pushed ahead now. And I think it's a great thing. Can, can I double up on that? Like, I, I'm sure all of the folks in the audience have experienced this as well. It's like a new renaissance, right? It's like the, one, the moment the pandemic hit, or not the moment, like the few, first few months, it's like everyone was forced online. And, and the folks who've been essentially living here are, full, are like our whole lives, especially the, the perhaps the more introverted folks um, who love to lurk. Um, God, this was like, oh my God, like, it's kind of like that that small indie party that you have in middle school that like is pretty cool but then suddenly it became popular like oh my god what the fuck like there's all these people here and for, for i think what's interesting is to watch a handful of folks in this space there's like the old guard which are those really freaky weird people that you would find in a basement but we're finally realizing that those people are just like us and we're not so distinct or different than those folks there's just been some folks who've been in the in the community space for a, for a while, and so what a refreshing um, year this is going to be for the folks who have are new to community and kind of community thinking and community centric thinking, but also for the folks um, who've been around here for a while. Like this is, God damn it! Like this is our time coming, man. Sorry, bad language, but I'm so excited. Like this is it finally. Like for those who've been in the community space, preach, yo, preach. That's a good point. Now we're all stuck in basements of our old of our parents' houses. We're all exactly. I'm in my garage. Look at this. I'm literally Rob. in my garage. What were you going to say, Rob? I was just saying uh, something that John just said about you know the introverts, the lurkers. Um, part part of that is also the the degeneration of uh, social media as, um, like the be all and end all for, for, uh, uh, taking value out of a, a, a relationship or an interaction or, you know, the, a way of, of, uh, of engaging with people. I mean, some people in the, in the, in the chat are, are, are picking up on this as well. It's all become like influencers, bad news, or, uh, beating up on someone or other for some other reason. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, the world is, is uh, when you, when you uh, try and make something for everyone, you, you end up serving no one. And I think the difference between how um, social media has, uh, has grown versus um, curated media, curated communities have grown, uh, the, the main difference between now uh, and before is this willingness for people to make the effort uh, to find their um, their particular group or their their particular set of people, and not be making that decision um, uh, due to the number of people involved. 
So like social networks versus community networks, they, they have a different, um, the different persona. They, they're, they're speaking to a different part of you. A shared uh, experience, is it a shared uh, interest or is it the, the convenience of the crowd? And, I, and I, I love the fact that nowadays, because we're so saturated with everything, the crowd doesn't really matter as much as the curation. And, um, and, and so that means that, that introverts, that people who are unsure of themselves are actually able to talk more and they're encouraged to talk more. And these places are built for those people to talk more um, versus you being afraid to make your view known or to, to admit that you might have it wrong. And so I, I, I find that really interesting, that change in dynamic that we've seen. Um, it's not only a, a, a like a, a cultural change, but it's also a technological change and a willingness for people to go there. And that's been super interesting. Oh, Robert, yeah. what's one? There's a, both of you kind of, well, John, you mentioned the party getting too big at some point or, uh, and Rob, you were talking about, um, you know, having enough communities where everyone can find their own place. But, uh, I wonder a lot of the time when I'm putting together events in real life or when I'm putting together events now online, um, how do you decide, you know, how, how do you curate your communities? Do you uh, focus on inclusive versus exclusive communities? How do you kind of build things up and keep it feeling small and special without also excluding people who should be uh, and can be great contributors to your community? Uh, I can I can take that. I mean, so the nudge is unique in that like we text you and you're a part of the community of people who are receiving those texts. And so the actual uh, presence of the broader community is almost hidden unless we want to reveal it to you, which for us is, is a unique situation because if we don't find ways to like bring the community together in person or create some kind of virtual event or somehow share like who is part of this with you and what are they like, then there is no community at all. Uh, and so we have to kind of decide like selectively how to pick and choose doing that in a way that doesn't make it feel like this is too big and no longer cool anymore. And it's hard, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact answer. You know, we just kind of like selectively find ways to bring the group together in person. It's sort of how, how we think about that now. If I could like get really um, wanky with, with, with buzzwords, like if you're talking about inclusivity versus exclusivity, there's, there's, there's power in both of them. But dominance in either uh, will 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 lead to to zero value. So you need to um, think about you know the nice thing about building a community is that it's a product, um, and a product needs a customer. And uh, so a lot of those kind of questions that you're asking yourself when you're building a product or when you're making something is who's using this and what pain are they feeling. Um, if you're thinking about creating a a, a group on Facebook. You might be thinking about the same thing, but you also might not be. And I think that when you're uh, when thinking about how to go is it exclusive or, ex or inclusive, I always encourage people who are thinking about summits. You know, if you're running a virtual summit, your 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 um your first inclination is I want this to reach as many people as possible. So all of these speakers, I want them all. And you end up diluting the the, the whole pot so much that nobody really knows what it is they're 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 coming for. So getting back to understanding your, your customer, understanding your community member, and understanding their motivations, um, and, and taking some time to dig into that will, will allow you to uh, either reveal to yourself that you might not know what your, you know, what your customer uh, is wanting, um, but also hopefully that you will know what your customer is wanting and know where you fit into their life rather than you being the be all and end all, you can really fit very well into their life. And if that cohort is big enough so that that customer gets a lot of value or that attendee or that community member gets a lot of value, then you know, that's where you start. You don't, you don't try and make it any bigger than that. You don't try and, and, and make it uh, much smaller than that. Um, and then from there, you'll just see how it goes. Communities are living things, right? So like th they will grow organically um, as, as long as the seed is allowed to sprout. And if you, if you give it too much water, you'll drown it. If you don't give it enough nutrients, it, it doesn't get going. So um, I, I think dr drilling it down to personas, customer personas, I know that it sounds like it, it, uh, it boring, but that it's, it's, it makes such a difference. So stay focused on your audience for, for the specific thing that you're doing. For the specific yeah, be, be okay to say this isn't for you. 
because you don't fill in fit into this this set of uh, you know requirements. That's a powerful thing to be able to say. If someone says is telling me about their summit and, and I'm saying, okay, so who's this not for? And they don't have an answer to that, that's not a good sign. Man. I mean, this is exactly why I wanted to be on this panel, <laughs> because to hear folks like Robert and that quote, which I know a bunch of folks empower both exclusivity, and inclusivity, just love the way that you said that, masterful. Um, I think one of the, the the hints, key insights was actually from last, the last talk from Jake McKee. He sat on that slide around joy and giving joy to folks. And I know that sounds squishy, but honestly, I like you know when you're heard you also know when this is a safe place or not. And it's very like, you know if you've created a safe place and you know if your customers feel like this is a safe place. And even using that language, by the way, you know, safe places and mental and emotional safety and mental health, like that's exactly what Robert was talking about. It's, it's opened up kind of the canvas of, hey, it's not just a bunch of random folks on the internet. It's no, these are real humans with emotional psychological needs Right, some want there to be educated. Some want to just want to be entertained. But is this a safe place? And I think that's a question that I ask the folks that I coach and the, the companies that I, I try to work with is, like, are we creating a safe place? I, I don't care so much around the tooling. I don't care so much around the technology. But you know, is is this a place where I could share something that you could use to harm me? Right. If I give you a piece of information, for instance, I'll just share publicly here. I'm a suicide survivor. I know for a lot of people that just triggered them. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But clinical anxiety and clinical depression is something that I have to deal with every single day. And community is the solution for a lot of that. It's I want to be involved in safe places and I want to create safe places for the folks that I work with, and the folks that I serve. To kind of combine this with one of the questions from Francisco, which is great, it's, hey, we've got a lot of folks who are essentially what I think Francisco is talking about is people who are building community opportunistically, right? They're saying, hey, shit, this is kind of like the cool thing, the criminal, this is like the lingua franca now, this is, this is the zeitgeist, so we should just take advantage of this. That's going to happen anyway. There are, you know, there are snake oil salesmen for every major um, kind of technological and social event. I think something Robert said, which is very key, I just want to add one thing, which doesn't take from his point at all. It's some communities grow and some communities die. And the, the, the life cycle of being born and then al also death is really important. Some folks like are managing communities that are literally dying. And it's so frustrating because they're trying to keep it on life, life support. To, to, what I, to which end I say, to what I say, why? A death of a community is a very natural consequence of life and being able to let go and kind of let those people go and find other safe places is just as important as starting one. Um, and this is a very delicate thing, but now that more folks are thinking about this, they're thinking about the, the full life cycle. So what happens when this community no longer serves its function or purpose? What happens when this place becomes no longer safe? That's a question I think folks are asking about Facebook at a meta level. Is this a safe place for me? Generally, right? Or do we need to unbundle this? So fantastic question, Francisco. Thank you. And Robert, great thoughts. Oh my God. Yeah, I just, I mean, I just want to add one thing. Uh, one thing you said, Rob, that just really stuck a chord with me is that if you don't, if you can't tell people coming to your community that this is not for you, then you just don't have a very defined community. And, and you know, and one thing, one way I think about a community is it's kind of like a mirror. You're showing people the kind of person they are in, in joining your community. And if the thing that they see in that is really, really defined, then it's just not gonna be for some people. You know, oh, that's not me. But as communities grow, I just think it becomes really hard to not make what people see in the mirror really blurry because you wanna start to cater to new groups of people, but then you stop saying no to some groups and all of a sudden your community doesn't really mean anything to anyone, it's just people. So I, I just wanted to say, yeah, I find that way of thinking about it very interesting. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone, for your powerful shares. Um, we have like one kind of question left, and I would like to do a speed round right now. We have like one minute, maybe two. Um, what is the and you can't you you know you can't talk about your own product here, even though everyone wants to talk about our own stuff all the time. What is your favorite kind of community or gathering or new tool that you've been messing with lately? 
um, and why in like, you know, uh, one line in one sentence. Okay. I can do this real quick because I am absolutely obsessed with this small game. It's called Pico Tanks. I'm embarrassed to admit it. It's unbelievable. It's this iOS and Android game where you get to customize these very cute tanks and do 3v3 PvP. Holy fuck. I'm so obsessed. But anyway, the, the point is, um, I'm sorry. So there's a Discord channel. No one knows that I'm really playing, but I'm a D16. I'm one of the top ranked players in the world. No one knows it's me. So this is a beautiful anonymity. Oh, wow. Being at the top, well, shit, fuck. Don't, oh, we'll have to erase that. Um, oh, shit. That's bad. Okay, so anyway, we'll continue on. So I love, it's such a fun, exciting, just kind of mindless thing, but I'm getting to know folks in the Discord channel and like we're now, you know, there's a friend list and, uh, okay, so I just, yeah, so, so that, that's that. Pico, anyway. Tank. Pico Tanks, what about you guys? I am a patron of a, Patreon channel called Easy Allies. They basically cover video game news and culture. And it's just crazy how Patreon has empowered these groups of people to create meaningful engagement with these like medium sized and I'm sure also small communities. Uh, it's just crazy. Like people send them art, people participate in this like meta narrative that they have going on. Obviously, people like send questions for podcasts. So Patreon, I just think it's doing some really, really cool stuff with What's that channel called? Called EV Allies. EV Allies. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Very creative community uh, engagement going on there. Cool. And um, Rob, what uh, what have you been messing with lately? The hard one is I am I am the the dullest person on earth. So, <laughs> but um, I've actually been getting into one that's not new, but it's new to me. I've been trying to um, get into creative writing a bit bit more uh, and there's this network called Scribophile and it's been around for a long time but I and, and it, it there are parts of it that are very clunky but it's it's the design of it is that you have to be providing feedback and providing reviews in order to get anything that you write viewed by anybody um, and uh, I it's a that's a frustrating component but it means that Everyone has to, if you really want to get value out of it, you have to get value, you have to put value in it. And um, I don't know, I've been, in, I've been, I've been frustrated, but, but also really enjoying the, the mechanics of how that works. So, yeah. I've been in a writing group too, since the uh, pandemic started and that's, it's just a Slack group and we all help each other write. And I've really enjoyed being a part of that group as well. So I can understand the, uh, the value. Maybe you need to share with yours. <laughs> uh, I'd love, I, I, I'd love to know yeah, more I'll about ping that. you offline. Um, that's just a group called Compound. It's a small class, but I'll, I'll send you something. Um, cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, you know, some really powerful shares in there. Thanks for talking about what you do. And uh, I'm really excited to have gotten the chance to know you guys and, and, and have this conversation today. Cool. Thanks for hosting. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Great to meet you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye.